So we're going to just have a look at the, the first part of the chapter of Mark, Mark um, verses 1 through to 11, and we're going to chat about the journey of Jesus Christ to Jerusalem, the journey to Jerusalem. So open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 11. Right, Mark 11, open your cell phone or open your Bible. I see most of you have your cell phones, yeah? Right, now we're going to read from verse 1. <clears throat> All right, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a cold tide there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. All right? Let's read verse 3. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and, will, and it will, the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. All right, so let's have a look at verse 1. All right. Just the names of these towns and the city, just in the meaning of the names, there's already so much richness, all right? There's, there's so much depth. There in itself, you can find the message of salvation, all right? So I'm just going to quickly just touch. I'm not going to give you a message on that, but Jerusalem, the city of peace, all right? The city of God. Beth Page. Um, is the sit, is the house of figs? Now the next the next piece in the the book of well the chapter of Mark eleven goes about the fig tree that is cursed, cursed by Jesus, and there's a relevance um, to this this town Beth Page, which is called the house of figs. All right. So when you read, look into these things. Bethany, the house of figs. House of figs, what has that got to do with this chapter? Well, I don't know if you know, but a, there's certain palm trees that the fruit it bears is, uh, did I say dates? There we go, house of dates, sorry. The, the, the palm tree, the fruit it bears is dates. I only found that out by studying this piece. Okay, I thought dates was... Just some, just some kind of fruit that sat there and fermented from something else. All right. Okay, but a specific palm tree, the fruit it bears is a date. Okay. So in this specific region, in this piece, we're going to have a look at this palm tree. You're going to hear this this about this palm tree quite often as we speak. And then obviously the Mount of Olive, Olives. The revelation behind that is it's a mountain of olives. Deep. But at the foot of this mountain is the Garden of Gethsemane, which is known as the Olive Press. Right? Go and look at that as a, as a study in itself. Right? So Jesus sends two of his disciples, and he says to them in verse 2, Go to the village ahead of you, and... And just as you enter, you will find a cold tide there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. Right. What do we see happening in verse 2 and verse 3? Right. You've heard of the Logos word, the written word. Right, rhema word, the revealed word, or the spoken word, the preceding word of God. And then in the Old Testament, they speak about the Dabar word. It's a Hebrew, it's the Hebrew um, translation, Dabar. Many say that it's a similar to the rhema word. We're not going to go into there. But what does it mean? It's the divine, it's the divine word spoken. It's the divine word of God spoken. It's the divine word of God in action. Divine word of God spoken, it is the divine word of God in action. It has within it the latent power of God driving it into fulfillment. So what does that mean? It has power in it to make sure that it is completed. So it's a word that is spoken, but it is not only 
It is not only a word that is spoken. It is God positioning himself behind the word and putting power into it and making sure that this is going to happen. I am putting this word into action. I, God, am putting my divine word into divine action and it will accomplish the purpose for which I've sent it. So what else is this double word? All right, it carries momentum. You know what momentum is? All right, it carries momentum and velocity, right, to cause displacement in the spiritual and natural realm. Okay, so it carries momentum, right, so <laughs> momentum and velocity is, is a force, right, which causes displacement. So if I am, have momentum, which I have when I'm running or when I'm cycling, some of you know my cycling incident, right? I carry momentum, a forward momentum, and I can displace this thing in front of me in the natural realm. I can move it out of my way, all right? So that is the power that it has in the natural, in the supernatural, in the spirit realm, and in the natural realm, right? And this is not just a... a, a a spiritual concept. This is also, um, I, I was reading a, a documentary, a documentation, or whatever you want to call it, from a guy that studies physics about the power of words, how words can move, um, can cause things to be displaced in the natural. All right? So just imagine you are carrying the word of God which has divine power. Right? Divine power, not just natural velocity. Okay? So open your Bibles with me to Isaiah 55. Or scroll with me in your cell phone to Isaiah 55. And we're going to read verse 11. So this kind of summarizes, this scripture summarizes the, the word dabar. Right, and it says, so is my word that goes forth out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. It will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That is the word that goes forth from my mouth. Right? This is speaking about that Hebrew definition, dabar. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce the Dabar word exactly, but that's it over there. So when Jesus is saying in verse 2 and verse 3, go and do this, he says, go to the city, you will find this, you will do this, people will respond in this way, they will react like this, but you will leave with a cult. What is he saying? This is my Dabar word. This is my spoken word. This is divine action going with you. This is divine displacement going with you. You don't have to fear because I've gone before you. All right? That's the word of God. That's the power of the word of God that goes before us. And this is his spoken word on his journey to Jerusalem. So what do we see in verse 4, verse 4 to 6? I wrote here, the disciples are deployed by the double word of the Lord. Deployed. So they get their mission. They get their mission. They get their commission, all right, from God, and they are deployed. They are sent out. Now, I was wondering to myself while I was reading this, which of the disciples did Jesus choose to do this job? Did he choose those that would be the most eager to do it, the most willing to do it, the most passionate to do it, those that have the zeal that he knew would come back with a testimony, did he choose those that would always, yes, sir, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, yes and amen, or did he choose those that he knew needed to face a trial, face a challenge. 
which of the two, which which two disciples did he choose? Because there was a doubting Thomas. There was a Peter that would go in and somehow cut off the donkey's ear if he had to. All right. There were different characters in 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 this group of disciples. So which two did he did he choose? Because maybe some of you with your different personalities would would find it challenging. Would find it challenging to go and do what Jesus is asking these disciples to do. I know that I would find it pretty challenging because I, in my personality, I would first want to um, ask the people, hi, is this your donkey? Um, all right. Would, would you mind if we can use this for Jesus? You don't know who Jesus is? Well, we are disciples of Jesus, this, that, that. I'm not just the personality that's going to walk into the town. Here's the donkey, walk out. What are you saying? This is for the Lord. Okay. That's not my personality. But sometimes your personality can get in the way of the supernatural miracle that God wants to perform. And sometimes God wants to choose you specifically because He wants you to break through. He wants you to see the supernatural manifest because He knows that if you see the supernatural manifest, there's no turning back. There's no turning back because something is going to shift within you. And it's you. It's you that need that breakthrough. It's not the guy that is so passionate that will just do it. It's not the guy that will say yes and amen for everything. But it's you that will find this so challenging. Okay? Maybe that's you. So, when you respond with faith and obedience to the double word, you will see the divine word propel into divine action. All right? And this will bring fulfillment of the word. This, this whole concept, what is happening over here, is, is, all, uh, uh, is all playing out. Oh, my English. It's all playing out a prophetic word spoken in the Old Testament. And what we're seeing in the New Testament is the double word going out to fulfill that which was spoken back then. Jesus is coming and speaking and is looking for a vessel to bring into completion, to manifest that prophetic word that was spoken back then. So are you going to be part and parcel of this move that must take place now? There's a move that must take place now. Right? Moses and them were not born in Jesus' time. The disciples were. You are born in this, well, in this time and are living in this time of the lockdown. Jesus knew you were going to be here. So what is the word? What is the prophetic word? What is the thing that he wants you to fulfill now? What is that donkey that he wants you to go? And um, what do they call it in America? You see it all in these movies when the police come and say, you know, I'm taking, I'm commandeering. I'm commandeering your donkey. Okay? What is the donkey that you need to go and commandeer in this specific season to fulfill what Jesus wants to do in your life? but also in the lives of the people around you, also for this city. Okay? You with me? Right? So when his word goes forth, what we see with these, these disciples is they went into the place. Everything that Jesus said happened. All right? Everything that he said happened. Right? What happens is when Jesus' word goes forth, you will find yourself in the right place, in the right time, with the right people, right? With the right people who will do the right thing for the right purpose, for the right message. 
That is the power of the double word that is going forth. That is the power of the word. And that is what we need in this time. That is what we need in these uncertain times is that word that will position me in the right place, the right time, with the right people who will do the right thing for the right purpose so that I can carry the right message. Are you a vessel to carry this double word so that you can have these divine connections? Or is there something hindering you from having this fresh move, this fresh move of God? Right, open your Bible with me to Luke 1, 38. Scroll with me to Luke 1, 38. Let's rather say that. Luke 1, 38. And this is Mary, when the angel of the Lord comes and speaks to her. And she says, Behold, I am your servant. I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done with me according to your word. That word, word over there is in the Greek, rhema, right? According to your spoken word, which they also refer to as dabar, okay? According to your spoken word, according to your divine word, which is put into divine action. And that divine word that is put into divine action was taking shape within her. It started changing her. It changed her physically, and people could see the physical change. People could see, well, uh, I don't know if it was like that with her, but with most pregnant women, there's, there's emotional changes as well, all right? So there's an emotional change. There's a physical change. The way she walked changed. Okay. The way she spoke changed. She was mostly so excited about what is happening within her. She was excited about this work. All right? Word was spoken. There was divine action. There was physical change taking place. He's looking for a vessel. And this woman that was once insignificant has now become significant. This donkey that was once insignificant has now become significant. And this whole story kind of revolves around the use of a donkey. Deployed by the double word of God. So he takes what was insignificant and he makes it significant. So my question to you tonight just concerning this specific point is, what hinders your faith and your obedience? What hinders your faith and your obedience? Is it your personality? Is it your fears, fear for people, what they might say? When you go to the town and you have to do what God is saying, your fear, logic, but logically, it's not going to work. Doubt. Uh, did Jesus really say we must do that? All right. Doubting Thomas. Fear. Fear of man. Sure. Don't you think they're going to beat us if, you, if, if they see we're taking the donkey? You know, they're not going to just like Jesus said, Oh, yeah. You know, what are you doing? Okay, Jesus. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, take it. It's more like, what the hell are you doing? All right? Fear of failure. What if we fail? What if we come back or we don't come back with a donkey? Past experiences. I, I once, um, on, on evangelism, we, we did these uh, outreaches where we're going to town. And that kind of thing, I had, a, I had experience that kind of hit me quite hard where I, I went into a coffee shop and I just I gave a guy a word. And this guy just turned and he looked at me and he started shouting at me in front of everybody. And this experience nailed me so hard, right? It was, it was that 
evangelism was so negative for me, this kind of evangelism, going, going on the streets and doing that kind of stuff was so negative for me because of that experience, right? I still sometimes have a bit of a after, after shock when I have to go on the streets and Jesus loves you, all right? So past experience, what type of disciple are you? Or what type of disciple were you? Because you're not going to be that kind of disciple anymore. The negative sense. But you're not going to be Peter that cuts off the donkey's ear either. The next point here is I just want to highlight something about the significance of a donkey. Right? The significance of a donkey. So when you're doing a Bible study, once again, don't just read the word, but dig in. Why did, why did Jesus come in on a donkey? Why didn't he come in on a horse? Why didn't he choose a camel? Right? Why didn't he choose something else? Why didn't he choose something that was fit for a king? All right? So in ancient Bible times, or in those times as well, it was, it was common knowledge, or it was common knowledge, that when a king comes into town on a horse, he was most likely going to declare war. But when a king comes into town on a donkey, he comes in to declare peace and to come and... Um, oh, I don't know the correct English, but to, to uh, make a treaty. What's the right English, Patrick? To make a treaty with the people of that city. To come and declare peace and make a treaty with, that sit, with the people of that city. Jesus says a new commandment I've given, right? Jesus comes to... to um, oh, I'm not, let me, let me I'm, I'm going off the path here right now. Right, so Jesus comes in on a donkey to declare peace and to, to, to make a treaty with the people. I'm coming to pay the price so that you can be redeemed. So that you can be redeemed. So that you can become the righteousness of God through me. All right? The next point over there. A donkey is considered one of the most impure animals. So why did Jesus choose a donkey if it's considered one of the most impure animals? All right, it's considered doubly impure, doubly in, unclean. So there are two things that um, classifies an animal as unclean. All right, and it is the following: it is non-ruminating, and it has no cloven hoof. Right, non-ruminating, for those of you that do not know, is um, to ruminate, is to harko, to chew the cud. So basically, while you're sleeping, you regurgitate your food and you eat it again, like many students do. <laughs> Just want to taste that steak again. Okay. That is to ruminate. But non-ruminating means you don't do that. So donkeys don't do that. I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how that classifies as unclean. I, I would kind of consider it the other way around. Right? But that classifies as unclean. And the other is um, you are classified unclean if you do not have a cloven hoof. It has no cloven hoof. Now, a donkey has both of these. So it's double evil. In the sight of the Jews, right? Although it was a common means of transport, but Jesus still chose a donkey, right? He still chose a donkey. He still chose to enter the holy city on an unclean transport mode, all right? Another thing about a donkey is a donkey can be extremely stubborn, right? Extremely. You've heard the saying of a stubborn mule, do you guys have that in, in Russia? You don't have that in Russia? Like a, to say a stubborn mule? A stubborn donkey. 
like a hard-headed donkey. Same thing. Okay? So it's, a internationally, it's internationally known. Stubborn as a mule. Okay? But you need to earn the donkey's trust. But here we see that Jesus hasn't introduced himself to the donkey. He hasn't let the donkey warm up to him. He hasn't ridden the donkey before. Nobody's ridden the donkey. No one has tamed the donkey before, right? And here Jesus comes riding in on the donkey. Now we know Jesus is God. We know, but this is the supernatural being manifest in this journey to Jerusalem. This is part of the double work. What is happening in the double word is this supernatural provision. The donkey has been provided. There's divine connection. There's supernatural favor. These people, are, they don't know the disciples, but they are giving because they are compelled by the double word of God. And the, the impossible is taking place. This stubborn donkey that has never been tamed, that has never been ridden before, is now being ridden. All because of the double word of God, all on this journey to Jerusalem. When his word goes forth, he tames the untamable. When his word goes forth, he makes acceptable that which was once unacceptable. When his word goes forth, he makes possible the impossible. This donkey was born for a time such as this. You are in this time. You are living in COVID-19. You are born for such a time as this. What is the miracle that God wants to do through you? This cult was set apart for such a time as this. He was born for that time. He was set apart. Um, the word holy means to be set apart. This donkey was unridden. Only one was allowed to ride this donkey. Only one could ride this path. Only one could pay this price. Set apart for the king of kings. Set apart for his purpose. Set apart to fulfill the prophetic word that was spoken hundreds of years before. Born for a time such as this. Let's turn to the person next to you. And say, you were born for a time such as this. Okay, we're in level two lockdown, so I'm sure you can speak. Okay. If you can't, well, oops. Okay. Are you set apart? My question to you tonight, are you set apart? Is your life set apart like this donkey born for a time such as this? My question to you not, to tonight is, are you bringing a message of peace or are you bringing a message of war? Are you bringing a message of reconciliation in this time or are you bringing a message of division? In this season, we need reconciliation more than ever before. We need relationship more than ever before. Okay, there's people out there that are struggling with depression more than ever before. With issues more than ever before. We need the community. We need the brotherhood, the, the, the community, the fellowship of the, the, the brothers in Christ, of family, more than ever before. The third question over here is, do you allow him to tame you? Are you teachable? Or are you a stubborn mule? In verse 7 and verse 8, when they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. In verse 8, many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. Now, there's, a, there's significance to the person's cloak, all right? It symbolized your status, your authority, and your wealth. 
It symbolized your status, your authority, and your wealth, your cloak. So what did these disciples do? Putting their cloak on the donkey. I'm putting this on the donkey. I'm taking my authority. I'm taking my whatever it is, my status, my wealth. I'm laying it down for the service of the king. The people that were throwing their cloaks down on the floor, on, the, on this path to Jerusalem, this journey to Jerusalem, what are they saying? I'm laying down my status. I'm laying down my authority. I'm laying down my wealth. I'm laying down these things for the service of the king. In this season, what is it that God is asking you to lay down? In this season, what is it that God is challenging you? Maybe you have a position of authority that you can use to advance the kingdom. Maybe you have some form of status that you need to lay down. Maybe you have some image that you need to lay down because that image is hindering you from advancing the kingdom. Maybe you have wealth that belongs to the kingdom. Maybe you have wealth that needs to be channeled for the purpose of the kingdom. What is it that God wants to challenge you? What cloak is he challenging you to throw down? Now, I said we're going to speak about that palm tree, right? That palm tree, these, these branches that they're busy cutting down and throwing on the floor over here is the branches of the palm tree. And that specific palm tree is the, the palm tree that bears the, um, the, the date fruit, all right? The date fruit, right? Remember we said that the, the town of Bethany, that, that word Bethany means house of dates, okay? So this tree is specifically the, the palm tree that bears a date fruit. And go look into the significance of the date fruit um, to the, to the uh, um, Jewish people. So, well, let me not jump ahead of myself. All right. So the palm tree, the branches, are a symbol of victory, triumph, and peace. So once again, this king is coming on a donkey, declaring peace to the city, declaring peace to the people, and they are throwing down these palm tree branches, declaring victory, the victory of the king, the victory of the king in the season, but also declaring peace. This king has brought victory, but he's also brought peace. He's brought victory in the season, but he's also brought peace to us in this time of turmoil. He's brought victory to us in this time and peace to us in this time of turmoil. Revelation 7 verse 9 says that victory of the Spirit speaks about the victory of the Spirit over the flesh. It's also got to do with this whole, whole palm tree. In Psalm 92 verse 12, um, David says that the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. And which palm tree is he referring to? He's referring to this palm tree which bears the, the fruit, the date fruit. He's referring to this specific palm tree. Now, if you have a look at the, the significance of this tree, it is so, uh, for lack of better English, versatile, industrious. All right? They use almost everything of the tree for business. Everything is usable, if I can put it that way, from wine through to fruit, through to clothing. Everything is, is used, even in um, construction, all right? From wine through to construction, to clothing, to different kind of food, food thingies, right? But this tree also is upright, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, and this tree is long, it's, it's, there's longevity, it's, it lives long, right? It lives long. 
1 Kings 6 and Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, um, speaks about how... Um, I'm looking at the, the clock over there just for time. speaks about um, the temple. 1 Kings speaks about Solomon's temple, and the book of Ezekiel speaks about the heavenly temple, uh, temple the, the prophecy that is given to the prophet Ezekiel. And in both of these... There's a palm tree in the middle of these two cherubs, these two angels. There's a palm tree in the middle of these two angels. And what palm tree is it? What palm, palm branch is it? The palm tree that bears the date fruit. Declaring the righteous one. S symbolizing the righteous one. The righteous one, Jesus Christ, the righteous man. And on this path to Jerusalem, this journey to Jerusalem, they're not only declaring this king is coming in victory, they're not only declaring that this king is bringing peace, but they are declaring that this king is the righteous one. Without knowing it, they are busy fulfilling the prophetic. Without knowing it. David says the righteous will stand. And just like these temples are, are showing us um, this palm tree in between the angels, you and I have been made righteous through Jesus Christ. And we are also being built into a spiritual house. You and I are being built into a spiritual house. Right? Let me not elaborate too much because I need to finish off. We too will take our place as living stones, as righteous men and women. In Mark 11, the unrighteous are celebrating the victory of, of this king who comes in peace. The unrighteous, without knowing, are acknowledging him as the, as the righteous one. The unrighteous are acknowledging him as the solution for the people, for the city. The unrighteous are bringing praise to the king of kings. The unrighteous will soon have the opportunity to accept his work on the cross and claim their righteousness through Jesus Christ. And what we see, oh, let me just read this last piece here. We see from verse 9 through to verse 11. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. On this journey to Jerusalem, this Dabar word is not only fulfilling a prophetic word from the past. This Dabar word is not only positioning these disciples for divine encounter. It's not only bringing um, divine provision and divine favor and making the, the impossible possible. Right? It's not only positioning the unrighteous to, to um, acknowledge Jesus Christ as the king, to acknowledge Jesus Christ as the victorious one, as the righteous one, right? but it is bringing praise to Jesus. It is bringing praise that is due unto his name. And may we live in this season in such a way that others will bring praise unto his name. Because of our obedience to the double word of God. I think I missed something somewhere, but let me just end off with a short testimony. So, Pastor Cornelius had a day word a while back, I think it was last year. Um, about a certain amount of kilometers, and at the certain amount of kilometers, you have to cross this um, train track, and after crossing this train track, there's a certain um, amount of houses or whatever um, on the left side or the right side, I can't remember, but this day I went with him, traveling on this Dabar word or this Rhema word, and um, we set out. We were deployed, we were deployed by the double word of God, okay, looking for this donkey 
looking for this, these divine connections, these people that God wants to minister to. So we drove in a certain direction, in a certain kilometers, and at that exact kilometers, there was a train track, with this bridge that this day we spoke about. And um, it, when you see these things, it kind of stirs up faith. Just like I think these disciples were excited about when, okay, Jesus said there was going to be a donkey there. And they look, there is a donkey. So let's take the donkey and look, the people are going to come and beat us. Wow, Jesus said that. Okay. So it kind of stirs up faith to continue, to continue further. So we carried on further. We carried on pressing in. And this road became terrible, like almost... How can you say it? Undrivable. Almost like the donkey. Untamed donkey that you can't ride on. All right. Um, even to the place where we were wondering, or I was wondering, how on earth can a bucky even drive, drive on this road? It doesn't even look like people drive on this road anymore. Anyway, we came to this gate eventually. We came to this gate. And there's no bell you can't even see a house. It's like this hill. The Apostle Cornelius climbs out the car and, oh, we're going to climb through the fence. My personality is, you can't just, you can't just climb through the fence. You've got to first phone the people or just ask, may we come in? Okay. So here I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> no trespassing. Here we're trespassing. What if these people are very unfriendly and don't, don't like this kind of idea of people just trespassing? But yeah, the pastor is determined, Pastor Cornelius is determined um, to bring this message um, that he believes God is wanting to give. And here I am tagging along with him. Very uncomfortable for having to trespass um, and disobey the law um, of what might, what might make other people feel uncomfortable. So we're walking, we're walking over this hill, we're coming down, and at distance, I think it was maybe about 100 meters. What's a, what's a bok was it? Was it a blow beast? Right? A blue willabies. Okay. Um, was there, and he stood up, and he started, I don't know if he was snorting or whatever he was doing, but he, st he started showing us that he wasn't happy with us over there. And all of a sudden, my heart wasn't happy with us being there either. Not just emotionally, but my heart started pounding. My heart started sitting over here. My lungs decided to join my heart and my throat. Um, so you just make some space for us too. We don't want to be alone. Don't leave us alone down here. Um, and we're walking down here and this thing is over there. And we're keeping, keeping it in the corner of our eyes there. And the, 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 the ground is terrible, man. Once again, I don't know how a, a bucky can ride there. And there's, what's a flakfark? Warthogs. There's warthogs. Jumping out of every hole and running all over the place. I'm, I'm creating, I'm just coloring in, in a little bit. And I'm concerned that these people have dogs. There's an animal over there that's unhappy with us being here. That thing can cause damage to us. We don't know if these people are friendly. We're trespassing on their property. We don't know if they have dogs. Right? Usually places like this will have dogs and vicious dogs. Okay? So we're walking and all, we, we see this house over here. And we come to the house and we're looking and I see these, these dolls. Now it's these material dolls. And the head is ripped off of this material doll. And I'm, I'm standing there thinking... Is this witchcraft? Is this just a child playing rough with his toys? And immediately, like, 
there's this, there's this fear inside of me that is causing me to read things into things. All right? So I'm misinterpreting the whole situation. I'm reading things that are not even between the lines. Um, I'm seeing this witchcraft taking place over here. I don't know if it's a child just playing rough or if it's witchcraft taking place here. And we go to these other, um, there's nobody there. We go to these other, what's a skid? Sheds. We go to these sheds. We can't find anybody there. Then the pastor sees, okay, there's this fence and there's a house over there. Okay, no. We've got to go to the house. We've got to speak to someone. I'm like, Aah. I'm like already half dead. It's hot. I'm thirsty. We've almost been killed by this, this, this beast of a thing. There's war togs. I don't know if there's wild dogs or something going to... There's, there's dolls with heads pulled off. And I don't know what else. Now we're walking up this fence. And I've got my neat clothes on. Okay? My neat shoes and all of this stuff. The pastor's also got some neat clothes on. He's luckily he had a... Uh, uh, blazer on as well. I'll explain just now why, luckily. Um, and we're walking and we're walking and we're walking along this fence and we're walking through bushes and through thorns and through everything and this electric fence and we're just not finding an entrance to this other house. But the pastor is determined to deliver this word. I am determined just to get out of this flippant place. I'm hot. I'm tired, my clothes are dirty, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm waiting for the next animal to come and bite my head off. And we carry on walking, and the next moment, out of nowhere, I just hear the sound. <laughs> and yeah, out of the bushes comes this thing running. Man, I thought donkeys were only this, this small. I don't know if it was just me misinterpreting the situation, but that thing felt massive, <laughs> felt huge, and this thing wasn't happy with us being there. It wasn't happy with us being there at all. Now the pastor had his jacket, took his jacket off, and luckily for us, when we, when we, what do you call it? I wanted to say, swang that thing. Patrick, what's the right word? <laughs> Took his jacket off and with this motion we would flick, flick the jacket up in the air and this donkey would just pull back a little bit like this. But then as we walked, this, this donkey would pace with us. It's as if this donkey was just saying, you are not moving any further. You are not coming past you. So as we would walk here, the donkey would walk up and we would walk, donkey would come this way. So we decided, okay, let's make our way back. And man, I was, I was already, I was, I was gone. My faith had gone. My, my delivery of the message had gone. There was nothing left of me. Everything was finished. All right. And so we, we're walking on our way back. And once again, there's buck running this way. There's warthogs running that way. And um, I'm thirsty. I'm hot. And the pastor's saying we must pray for these people in this place, pray for this property. And he's busy prophesying over here. I'm just prophesying that I'm not going to die. It was God, you brought us here, and it's the pastor that's brought me out here to die today. And um, so we finally come to our ascent. We come to our ascent, and then all of a sudden, here from my, my four o'clock, the sound. <coughs> I don't know how a donkey makes, but that's what it sounded like, all right? All of a sudden, there's three, three donkeys coming from there, and then I thought it's over. I thought it's over. Then I grab the jacket, and I'm busy flipping this way, and that other buck is there, so it's flip that way, flip this way, while you're busy walking, and the pastor's prophesying, and I'm just flip, flip. Right, and it, it was the end. There was no message. There was no gospel in my heart. There was nothing. There was nothing. I'm just flip. Why are we here? And we're walking back over. We get to the the fence, and we have to climb through the fence again. 
uh, to get to the car, just by the way. And then the pastor is determined he's going to deliver this message. So he writes a letter. There's no post box. I'm thinking, oh. he's got a piece of paper that he just tore out of his diary. He's writing it there. There's no post box. How? Oh. Folds up the piece of paper. It's like nobody drives on this road. Who comes in here? I'm sure there must be a other entrance that these people come from because nobody comes this way. Puts the letter there. Go back. I feel like my heart's not in the right place. Um, this message, I don't know. David was great, fantastic. May the Lord do something, but I don't know where I'm at. I don't know if it was a week later or two weeks later. My pastor gets a phone call. It's these people from this farm. They want to have a meeting with him. And um, somehow it was a connection. Um, they were also involved in the homeschooling group with uh, Pastor Jeline and their, their kids. And they also did some classes with Criari. So it's some connection via some connection. And they want to come and speak to Pastor Cornelius. And it's a divine connection. One of us walked away with a testimony. One of us missed destiny. One of us walked away with a testimony. One of us missed destiny. On this journey to Jerusalem, which kind of disciple are you going to be? And how are you going to react to that Dabar word of God? Are you going to walk away with a testimony? Or are you going to miss destiny? And may the season that we are in May you only walk with testimonies as you walk with the double word of God. As that double word of God shifts you into a fresh move, into a fresh relationship with God in the season. Amen. Father God, we just pray that you touch our hearts like never before. Holy Spirit. We surrender, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender ourselves to you in Jesus' name. There where our hearts may have drifted, there where we may have stagnated in the season, Lord, we pray, we need your word, we need your word. We want to be part of this move. We are here, we are born for this time, for this season. We want to see the supernatural manifest. We want to be part of your plan. We want to be part of your plan for this specific season, for this now time. We want to be set apart for your use. We want to be set apart for your kingdom. Lord, we want to lay down that which we have, that which hinders us, Lord, um, so that we can advance your kingdom, so that we can be part of your plan, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we want a testimony. We don't want to walk away and miss destiny in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we pray that you help us. We know that you are always faithful. We pray that you take us by the hand, that you pick us up, and that we will also take our responsibility and stand up in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.